else could he look? Where else can we look tonight? Where else do we dare look tonight? We need to look to our Heavenly Father. And Jesus is there in the midst of his agony, in the midst of his suffering, in the midst of all the torment that's going on around him, the accusations, the, uh, the mockery, the uh, wagging of the heads, and, and all that's going on. And the nails are still through his hands and through his feet. The thorns are still on his brow. His back is still bleeding from the whipping he took. And so he, he calls out and he begins this prayer by invoking his heavenly father. And he says, Father, Father. You know, Jesus was in the position that if anyone needed prayer at that moment, it would have been him, wouldn't it? If there was anybody at that very moment that he says these words that needed prayer, it would have been him. And I'm sure that all of us, if we were in his position, when we would have called out to God, we would have been calling out to God to help us. He didn't mention himself. He says, Father, and he opens up this, uh, this dialogue with God. He's not asking for himself or in behalf of himself, but he's asking for his enemies. He says, Father, and then what does he ask? He invokes the Lord's help, or God the Father's help, and then he says, forgive them. His petition is that God the Father would forgive his tormentors, his would-be murderers. Stop and think about it. Stop and think about it. He's not praying to be delivered from the cross. He's not even praying for a lessening of the agony that he's in. He's not praying that the Lord will ease the pain. He's not praying for vengeance tonight. You and I might have. Lord, give this bunch what they deserve. But you know what Jesus is doing? He's practicing what he preached. He's illustrating to you and to me that what he preached in the Sermon on the Mount is absolutely doable. Under the worst circumstances, under the most trying circumstances, under the most intense suffering, you can still forgive your enemies. Isn't that amazing? Jesus was practicing what he preached. He preached on that sunny hill on the Sermon on the Mount that we were to love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for those who despitefully use you. That's the words of Christ. And that's exactly what he's doing in this prayer. Praise God. Don't you love to have a preacher practice what he preaches? <laughs> Don't you love to see a Christian practice what they believe? Well, Jesus did. He lived up to his own preaching here. He lived up to his own high standard. Peter said, I, Lord, would it be all right if I just forgive him seven times? And Jesus said, yeah, something like seven times 70, Peter. And then you're getting close to what you ought to be doing. Forgiveness is an amazing thing. But Jesus was praying. He was praying for them to be forgiven. He was asking God to move that guilt off of them. He's providing a way that they can be saved. Basically, he's providing a way. Now, he's also probably sparing them from maybe instant judgment. I wonder what would have happened on that hillside if Jesus hadn't have prayed these few words. If you read through the Bible, and Robert mentioned one of the issue instances in the Bible, where judgment was immediate. He mentioned Korah. Korah is mentioned in the New Testament as well. He tried to overthrow God's government. He tried to kick God's man to the side and take over what God had called Moses to do. That's a bad thing. But God let the earth split open. Remember, God allowed the earth to split open and Korah and all his household went down into hell, just dropped into hell, friends, because God immediately performed judgment. And that was, that was touching his prophet Moses. 
Here they're touching his beloved and only begotten son. I wonder, and again, I could give you a number of instances where God allowed instantaneous judgment. Look at Ananias and Sapphira. I mean, and all they did was lie to the Holy Ghost. That's not all. I'm not saying that to minimize that, but the sin that they committed was lying to God. How many people would drop dead today if God did that? We'd have mass graves. <laughs> and we'd have churches full of dead people. Because so many people testify to what they don't possess. God help us never to do that. But they, you're not lying to men, friend. You're lying to God. And he knows it. You can't, you can't hide it from him. But you think of all the things, even, even moving the ark back, back into Jerusalem. You know, David didn't research it enough. He didn't, he didn't research it to how the ark was supposed to be moved. And he thinks, you know, it's on a nice cart. We'll just continue to take it in on the cart. And the poor man steadied the cart, steadied the ark, because he was afraid it was going to fall off the ark. Uh, the, their roads must have been about as bumpy as some of our interstate. The ark was a rocking on the cart, and he was afraid it was going to fall off. And all he did was put his hand up to steady, and he was smitten dead. Not doing it God's way. Over and over and over, Miriam and Aaron were smitten with leprosy, or Miriam was smitten with leprosy at another time. You think of all the times and instances where God rendered immediate judgment on the crowd that was sinning. And if there would have ever been a time in the history of God's dealing with man that it would have been appropriate, I think right here would have been appropriate. They lied on him. They falsely accused him. It was a mistrial. They have murdered a man that has been declared innocent by two judges. Two Roman judges declared him innocent. And they still crucify him. But Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. It's an amazing thing to me. When you think about all the mockery, the crucifixion, the scourging. You think about everything that was included in, in getting him to this point on the cross. It included the Roman governors, Pilate and Herod. It included the Roman soldiers who actually did the execution. It included the Jewish priests and rulers who brought the charges against him. It included the multitude that were crying out, crucify him, crucify him. It included the passerbyers that never bothered to wonder why he was there, just wagged their heads and went on by, rejecting him as well. It included the thief that didn't repent. The opportunity, friend, forgiveness became available when Christ said forgive them. And no matter how much wrong they had done to him, Jesus Christ still loved it enough to say, Father, forgive them. And if that don't boggle your mind just a little bit, <laughs> you just think about how upset you got because someone got that parking place in front of you. I mean, just think about the little things that upset us sometimes. I mean, people get upset. He had been beaten, brutally beaten with a fist in the face. His beard had been plucked out. Long Palestinian thorns driven down in the tender area of his scalp. And his back had been beaten with a scourge. And his hands were pierced with nails and his feet were driven with nails. And the only way he could breathe was lifting up his body weight off of, those, off of the, the, the hanging weight that he was. He had to lift it up so the diaphragm could allow the lungs to expand one more time. Every time he wanted a breath, he had to pull on those open wounds that were hanging on those nails. Can you imagine such suffering? I would not have been surprised if he said, Father, it's not worth it. They, they don't appreciate it. And he said, I could have called how many legions of angels? He said, I could do that, but he didn't, thank God. Are you glad he didn't? <laughs> Aren't we glad tonight that Jesus did not call the legions of angels and wipe out the earth? Praise God tonight, friend. He opened up the doors of mercy is what he did. 
He opened up the doors of mercy, not only to that crowd, but to this crowd tonight. Whosoever will now can come because Jesus has prayed for our forgiveness. You may have been the enemy of Christ. You may have taken his name in vain. You may have trampled his blood under your feet. You may have resisted the Holy Ghost. But I want to tell you, Jesus is still praying, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. The argument why he did is point number three. That was a petition. They know not what they do. Have you ever pondered that? Now, whatever Jesus says is right. Okay, I'm not questioning the validity of the statement. But why didn't they know? How could they not have known? I'm not questioning what Christ said. He said it. It's absolutely true. He is the truth. Never question scripture. Question everything else. <laughs> Never question the word of God. Jesus said it. And that's what it is. Father, they know not what they do. He's not excusing his enemies or justifying their deeds, I don't believe. But he is, uh, he's letting us know that there's something that they don't know. But could it be said that there were some things they did know? You believe there were some things they did know? They knew they were mistreating a human being. And I think the majority of the crowd knew that they were crucifying an innocent man. I believe they didn't, they knew, they knew that the extent of their, you know, that they were, they were guilty in part, even if they hadn't have been in the crowd that cried crucify him. By their being there and by their going ahead and agreeing with this death, this mockery, this shame, they too were part and parcel of the problem. They had the scriptures, they had the prophets. It warned them about the Messiah, his life, his death, his birth. It, it's all recorded in the Old Testament that the, they should have known. They should have recognized him. And then the miracles that he did, they should have recognized no man can do these miracles except God be with him. Amen. Right? That was the testimony of some of the people. The, the, the people that were hired to trip him up in his words came back and said, no man ever spake like this man. There's nobody that has ever said words like these. And they're with unction and they're with power and they're with a, an anointing that the, the, the Pharisees and the scribes, they teach us, but this man teaches with authority. There's something about his words that are different. Praise God. They didn't know everything, but they knew some things, didn't they? They should have known. They should have picked up from the miracles. This is no ordinary man. This is not an ordinary situation. And then Jesus' own words, his teaching. How many of them that were there around the cross that day had actually heard him teach? I don't know. But I, I would imagine that his teachings went far and wide. They were so radical. They were so different from the norm that the people were used to in those days. The teaching of Jesus was so more in-depth and so more uh, close and personal. It wasn't abstract stuff. He dealt right down where we were living. And gave us the message. But the scripture says, or not the scripture, but there's a, there's a saying that says, none are so blind as those who will not see. You get that? None are so blind but those who will not see. They had shut their eyes to the truth. They refused to accept his testimony. They refused to accept his role as Messiah. They refused to acknowledge him as the Son of God. They refused to, to give credence to his deity and his mission. They refused to do that. So they were, in a sense, they didn't realize what they were doing. That they were cutting off the one and only one that had the key to eternal life. They were hanging on a tree, the only sinless human being that's ever lived or ever will live, Jesus Christ. 
There were some things they should have known, and maybe there were some things they did know, but the very important thing about their never dying soul, it evaded them. It escaped them. They did not get it. That he came to give his life a ransom. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Thank God tonight. Uh, but it's, it's so very, it's so very important tonight that we get a glimpse of who he really is. Who he really is. What he's really about. You know, some would look around and said, well, was the prayer answered? Was that prayer answered? Well, I, again, I believe there could have been a totally different picture. There could have been mass graves all over Calvary had God decided to, to bring vengeance on that crowd. But Jesus, praying for their forgiveness, allowed them to walk away and go home that night. But there were a couple of people in the crowd at least, and probably a lot more than that. We just don't know about them. But we know that poor thief on the cross got his eyes open. He got his eyes open. He realized there's something different about this middle man. There's something different about him. He's not cursing. He's not threatening. He's not praying for God to send fire down on him and destroy him. He's not. He's, he's praying for God to forgive this bunch. And oh my, it had an impact. It had an impact on that thief. So when the other one railed on him and said to, you know, get us down from here if you be the son of God. An old thief on the other side said, listen man, we're getting what we deserved. This man's done nothing worthy. The old thief realized something. This man's done nothing worthy of death. He's here. He's not here for his own sin. And he said, Lord, remember me. You're talking about simple prayers. You're talking about simple confessions. You're talking about heartfelt repentance without saying a lot of words. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And that old thief looked over and Jesus looked back at him and said, Son, today, today you'll be with me in paradise. You won't have long to wait, buddy. Sundowns are coming. They're going to break your legs. You're going to die pretty quick. But I'm going to die too, but it's not because they break my legs so I can't raise myself up and breathe. That's why they broke the legs, you know. So they couldn't raise their body up and they couldn't get the lungs to open up and get the air they needed to breathe. That's why they broke the legs of the victims. If they wanted to end this thing pretty quick, just take an ax and break both shin bones and both leg bones and that's the end of that in about a minute, a minute and a half. It'll all be over. But Jesus didn't die with broken legs. Not a bone was broken. <laughs> Praise God. The scripture is true. The Bible is true tonight. I stand on the word of God tonight, don't you? Not a bone of his was broken. Just like it says he never saw corruption. Jesus Christ, he was busy the whole time he was underground. <laughs> He wasn't just laying there on that cold stone slab. He was down into the, 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 the realm of the dead, all the way down into the place of the departed dead, preaching to the spirits in prison. What was he saying? I wished I knew. I wished I knew what that sermon was all about. But Jesus Christ, he's real. And friend, he's, he, he's, he's, he's provided forgiveness and the old thief took advantage of it. I believe the centurion, when the earthquake took place and the, the, the long uh, eclipse, if you call it an eclipse, I believe it was just noonday darkness, 3 p.m. darkness. And the old centurion, when Jesus died and gave up the ghost and the earth shook, there was an earthquake. And friend, I want to tell you something. That old centurion said, surely this must have been the Son of God. He, he named it. He, he gave credence to where it belonged. He said that with conviction and faith. Surely this must be the Son of God. There's two that found forgiveness at the cross. Amen. And I believe there are others. I believe there's out of that 3,000, 50 days later at Pentecost when that great crowd was in Jerusalem, 3,000 people prayed through. I wonder how many of those had been at the cross, heard those precious words, Father, forgive them, hadn't been able to sleep, hadn't been able to eat right, hadn't been able to get it out of their mind. Old Brother Gilbert said when that group of visiting Christians came to his house, he was a brawler then, 
He had been raised in the Catholic faith. He didn't know anything about genuine salvation, but said those people quoted uh, Isaiah 118, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And he said, that stuck in my soul like a barb. He said, that stuck in my mind. I could not get away from it. I could not shake that thought until one day traveling around the bypass around Cincinnati, he looked up through a dirty pickup windshield and said, if there's a God in heaven that can do that, then do it for me. And he said, God, the Holy Ghost. And Jesus came into the truck cab he got saved going around Cincinnati, Ohio in his old jalopy truck. And he, he lived a victorious, wonderful Christian life, soul winner, just, just an excellent soul winner. But that stuck in his heart like a barb, he said. I couldn't get away from it. And I imagine there were people there on the day of Pentecost that those words were haunting them. What did he mean, Father, forgive them? What did he mean? And then when Jesus, Jesus, uh, not Jesus, when Peter began to preach repentance in the name of Jesus. Oh, now we see. And 3,000 people, I don't, I, I'm sure all of them wasn't there. But I could be fairly sure that some of them probably were there. But did it work? Did God answer his prayer? Are people still getting saved? Thank God they are. Praise God, they are, not in the numbers I'd like to see, but they are. Praise the Lord. Well, Jesus' prayer was answered, and it's still being answered. Forgiveness, though, only comes to those that yield. It wasn't a blanket thing. You realize that? It wasn't a blanket thing saying all of you are now forgiven. He didn't say that. He asked the Father to forgive them, and the condition of that forgiveness is still coming to Christ with a broken and a contrite heart and asking forgiveness, repentance of your sins and confessing your sins to God and letting Jesus Christ forgive you. It's his great plan. It's still working today. And, uh, <clears throat> but forgiveness only comes to those who yield themselves to Christ. He prayed for us and he died for us. And as we yield ourselves to him, his prayer will be answered again and again and again, the story of a little old lady, poor lady, very poor woman. She had, a, she had one son. She wanted her boy to go to college. So this poor dear lady, she worked hard. She made money by personal sacrifices, gave up every, every earthly enjoyment herself in order to provide her son the privilege of going to, to college. When the son was to graduate, he wrote his mom. He said, Mom, I want you to come to the graduation. She wrote back, son. She said, I, I only have two old dresses and they've already been, how was it? She said, they've already been turned once. What does that mean, ladies? Inside out? I don't know if she meant that the outside had got so dingy she turned it in. This is an older story. But it said that she had told her son that I only have two dresses and they've already been turned once. And I would have to dress a shabby that I would be a reproach and a shame to you if I come to your graduation. But the boy would not take no for an answer. Came the day for his graduation. He walked down the aisle with his plainly dressed mother, put her in one of the best seats. To her great surprise that night, her son was the valedictorian of the college graduating class. And it says when the awards were given, the honors were given. This son took the prize that was given to him, stepped down, kissed his precious little mother, and said, here, mother, here is the prize. It's yours. If it had not been for you, I would have never been here. And friend, that's how we got to look at it with Jesus. Lord, all the prize goes to you. All the glory goes to you, Lord. Any awards that we get down here, who does it go to? It goes to Jesus. Praise God, church. You know, he, he deserves all the honor. He deserves all the glory. Because without his sacrifice, you and I wouldn't amount to a hill of beans. We wouldn't amount to a thing. But I'm so glad tonight he said, Father, 
Forgive them. They know not what they do. Well, praise the Lord. Anyone got anything on your heart before we change the order of the service? Parishioners, phone parishioners, thank you for being on the phone tonight. May God bless you. Have a great week. Okay.